the Alexis, the Alexis Nagoda Sioux Nation, the Enoch Cree Nation, the Whitefish Lake First Nation, and the Paul First Nation. This area also has deep meaning and importance to the people of the Métis Nation of Alberta. Premier Jason Kenney and my colleague Jason Luan, Minister for Community and Social Services, have joined us here today for what I'm sure is going to be a compelling announcement in support of Alberta women. I want to thank Dr. John Lilly, Co-Chair for Pregnancy Pathways, and Tricia Smith, Executive Director for Boyle Macaulay, for joining us here as well. Alberta's government is making unprecedented investments in women all across the province, from inking a childcare deal that has saved families an average of 50% a year on daycare, to supporting women entering into the STEM workforce as Alberta's knowledge-based economy comes, to, comes roaring back. Today's announcement will build on that important work, and we know that women thrive when families thrive, communities thrive, and therefore our economy thrives. Now I'll pass this along to Premier Kenny to tell us more about today's announcement. Thank you very much, Minister Isaac, and thank you, Tricia, for welcoming us here to Boyle Macaulay. If folks are wondering why we're wearing masks, it's because Boyle Macaulay is a health services centre, and it's very important we uh, continue to respect those protocols in places like this. And thanks also to Minister Lawan for joining us. Before I get to today's very happy announcement, I, I do want to talk about a couple of other things. Uh, first of all, a, a quick report on my recent trip uh, to Houston to Zero Week, which is the world's largest energy conference. Um, and I can just report that Alberta's message uh, was very well received. Uh, people around the world understand that Alberta can be a critical part to the global energy crisis, to greater energy security, uh, and to energy inflation that's hurting all of us and people right around the world. All of this uh, provoked in part by Vladimir Putin's brutal invasion of Ukraine, which has highlighted what Albertans have been saying for years, that we need more responsibly produced democratic energy from Alberta to displace uh, conflict oil from places like Russia and OPEC dictatorships. Uh, I also had meetings uh, with key leaders of major international businesses who either are, have announced large uh, multi-billion dollar investments in Alberta or are planning on stepping up with significant investments uh, in areas like petrochemicals and hydrogen. And I can say that uh, optimism about Alberta's economic future only continues to rise, as does an interest in working with us to get more energy infrastructure built so we can play that positive role in global energy markets. Uh, Minister of Energy Sonia Savage continues to uh, uh, work in Houston at Sierra Week, and I understand uh, yesterday afternoon met uh, briefly with U.S. Secretary of Energy uh, Granholm, and uh, I just got off a call with the Premiers at, through the Council of the Federation and uh, re can register um, widespread support for Alberta's message about the urgent need uh, to build energy infrastructure, uh, n not only because it's in our economic interests, but more importantly right now, because it's in the in interests of global peace and security. And we hope to have more to report on that in the days and weeks to come. Secondly, I just wanted to underscore an announcement I made this morning when speaking to uh, mayors and councillors from across the province at Alberta's municipality, and that is uh, the important investments that Alberta's government is making to improve EMS services. That's emergency management services like ambulance services. We saw a 30% increase in demand last year and consequently some real stresses on the system. That's why Minister Copping has outlined a 10-point plan to improve EMS services, which I outlined uh, in my talk this morning, and this includes uh, $64 million in a new investment. Uh, a tw that's a 12% increase in the budget for emergency services, 28 million of which is for uh, more ground ambulances and crews, uh, 22 million of which is to increase capacity and extend uh, ground ambulance contracts, and 14 million of which is for the Hours of Work Initiative to address crew fatigue. So I'm happy to take questions on that. But let me now turn to uh, the reason for my visit here to uh, Boyle Macaulay, which is a venerable institution that's done so much over the years uh, to support um, Edmontonians uh, with health needs, especially people who face particular challenges in their lives. Um, and uh, this is a very exciting announcement 
that we will be providing more support for expectant mothers with extra needs. As I say, the Boyle Macaulay Center does fantastic work providing health care to vulnerable people, often those without a stable home, people fleeing a domestic violence situation, many coping with addictions or living with mental illness. Here, in this place, people can get the health care that they need without barriers to access from an interdisciplinary team of compassionate health professionals. Being here gives me the chance to thank the Center for all you do to make life better for Albertans. I also want to thank Pregnancy Pathways Program for the help that they give vulnerable expecting mothers. My thanks to John Lilly, uh, co-chair of Pregnancy Pathways. I remember meeting John about uh, four years ago and hearing about his, the, the fantastic work uh, that uh, uh, Pregnancy Pathways does uh, for expectant mothers who are often living um, uh, on income assistance or without a home and facing really unique challenges uh, to bring uh, their babies to a healthy beginning in their lives. And I just want to acknowledge and, and thank uh, uh, John and all of the uh, team that works with him to help uh, expectant mothers who are facing real challenges. As I say, thanks as well to Tricia Smith, Executive Director here at Boyle Macaulay, and all who make this facility the compassionate and caring place that it is. And thank you as well to uh, Minister Luan uh, for your work helping uh, uh, to uh, moms who need a hand up. It's all part of providing services and supports for moms who need a little help through tough times and support and stability through good times. Vulnerable expectant mothers already qualify for a $256 one-time natal benefit uh, that is part of the AISH and income support programs. But today we're taking that a lot further and we're keeping one of the promises made in uh, last month's throne speech. So let me quote from that speech. Quotes, uh, many vulnerable Albertans and girls have inadequate support. Uh, let me see here. Many vulnerable women and girls have inadequate support during pregnancy, which can affect their child's health and life chances. To assist low income mothers and improve health outcomes for their babies, the government will significantly increase and expand prenatal benefits to mothers receiving AISH and income support. Now, Community and Social Services, the department, will provide eligible mothers with a total of $600 starting in their second trimester of pregnancy. That's $100 a month for six months to help eligible women manage their challenges and improve health and well-being for themselves and their unborn children. Support early in a mother's pregnancy makes a real difference. We hope this money will help to ease financial pressures on families preparing to welcome a new member. It's another step towards reducing barriers and improving quality of life for women in Alberta. The Department of Community and Social Services estimates that this additional funding uh, will help about 2,500 mothers uh, who are on income support and receive H each year. Targeted investment in social supports like, like this helps moms and families today and can help to reduce costs to the provincial health system in the long run while contributing to a healthier future in Alberta. So I'm personally very excited about this. When I, somebody first suggested this idea to me last summer, I immediately asked Minister Luan, Luan to get to work on it, and I want to thank him and his officials for coming forward with this wonderful, compassionate, uh, life-giving uh, contribution to help uh, vulnerable pregnant women um, overcome challenges and ensure a, a great beginning for their babies. Thank you, and with that, I'm going to hand it over to Minister Luan for some more information. Thank you, Premier, and thank you for that exciting announcement. We worked hard uh, to, to uh, come to today to make that public. Thank you so much. And thank you to uh, Associate Minister Isaac joining us today. Indeed, this is a good news for women in Alberta. Uh, thank you, Dr. Lely, for your support, and thank you, uh, uh, Trish Smith, for your leadership in this area, too. Um, Hello, everybody, again, and I want to begin by uh, thanking Boyle Macaulay uh, Health Center for hosting us today as we make this important announcement. For more than 30 years, uh, Boyle Macaulay Health Center has responded to often the overlooked and unique health needs uh, of residents of Edmonton inner city. 
Uh, thank you for the wonderful work you and your volunteers uh, and your team at Pregnancy Pathways to do to support marginalized communities, including those experiencing homelessness. The Pregnancy Pathway Program is a vital uh, service for women, providing much needed uh, health support for pregnant women uh, in need. Every year in Edmonton, approximately 100 women are pregnant while experiencing homelessness. And those women uh, often don't have access to appropriate health services and your work uh, making it easier for those women to access care that they needed. The work you and many other community organizations do every day is vital to supporting some of the most vulnerable uh, among us. For many women, starting a family is an exciting time, but it, is comes, uh, it also comes with many challenges. This is particularly true for vulnerable women with limited financial resources. Uh, these women facing a number of challenges uh, during pregnancy, including employment, uh, not having enough food, and lack of access to primary care. The new prenatal support premier uh, just announced today will provide critical financial support services uh, for expectant mothers early in their pregnancy. We know from uh, best uh, practice research that uh, the prenatal period is a critical time for development and that can have long-term implications for child's life. Research has shown that uh, providing support early in women's pregnancy can result in healthier pregnancies and babies. Uh, this benefit means women will be able to devote more resources to their health, and that is good for everyone. All women deserve support to have a healthy pregnancy and babies. Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to invite Dr. Lily to share his words. Let me get out of here. Or good afternoon. I'd like to, to thank firstly the Premier and his ministers here today and Ms. Smith for their uh, uh, invitation to be here and to say a few words related to neurodevelopment. Babies need a good start and both the Minister and the Premier alluded to that. Uh, babies when a mother is stressed they don't do quite as well in utero nor did they do as well after birth. Similarly, nutrition is critically important during pregnancy because babies with better nutrition and also lower stress are born at a better birth weight and with a higher density of neuronal connections. You could imagine it as a spider web of connections and those connections, if they're dense, are a good thing because then the baby has the opportunity to prune those connections in early childhood and then to reorganize them again as a teenager. So what's happening today with this extra little bit of cash every month, that means the mother can have a little less stress, she can deliver better nutrition for herself and ultimately her baby, and there's all those other costs we know about that come with pregnancy. Mums who are pregnant are vulnerable, but they're also in a great situation because they're open to help and to suggestions when they've been struggling because they really do care about their baby. So thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you, Mr. Premier, Minister Luan, and Mr. Minister Isaac, um, and John, Dr. Lilly, for coming to the Bowen Macaulay Health Centre today to share the news of this new prenatal benefit. As was mentioned, the Bowen Macaulay Health Centre serves and supports more than 3,000 of Edmonton's most vulnerable individuals, many of whom are women, and we've been doing this work for over 40 years. 
we have the privilege of supporting some of those women who are at risk and their children through our Pregnancy Pathways program. Many individuals we support are experiencing homelessness, living in poverty, and struggling with histories of trauma, mental health, and substance use. As a result of those struggles, these individuals rely on government programs and social agencies to survive. As we are all experiencing these days, the cost of living is rising at an alarming rate. Those rising costs are only intensifying the challenges faced by vulnerable individuals, especially women. The additional benefit announced today is a very positive step by the Alberta government to recognize the distinct financial challenges and financial strain faced by expectant mothers. This new benefit will help already vulnerable women cover some of the unique costs that arise during pregnancy, such as clothes to fit their growing belly and shoes to fit their swollen feet. This new benefit, most importantly, will provide a little extra money for nutritious food and vitamins, as well as cribs and clothing for a safe and healthy baby. We are thankful the Alberta government is taking this step in support of some of Alberta's most vulnerable women. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. With that, we'll move to the Q&A portion of our press conference today. We have one reporter in person here today. So uh, please start with your name, your outlet, and who you're directing your question to. And we'll go with one question and one follow-up. Go ahead. Thank you. It's Amber Goslin with the Western Standard. And I'll direct my questions to the Premier, please. Sure. Premier, oh. for the second week, the UCP has disqualified a potential rival of one of your close allies. This morning, it was Tim Hoven. What do you say to your critics who allege the system is rigged in your favor? Well, as I said uh, to you last week, the United Conservative Party has a careful process to vet applicants to be uh, candidates for the legislature. Uh, and that's based on the commitment I gave to our members uh, when in seeking the party leadership in 2017, which is that we would not allow a repeat of the infamous Lake of Fire incident. And uh, we would take a, put in place a system to ensure rigorous screening of the background and views of prospective candidates uh, to screen out those who have articulated, uh, supported, or been associated with extreme uh, or hateful views. Uh, that process includes a local a candidate nomination committee, uh, which reviews uh, the background of each applicant. They do interviews and they make recommendations then uh, to the party's uh, candidate screening committee, which is made up of 10 individuals, half from elected officials from the party board and half are grassroots members. Um, and they review uh, the background of applicants to be candidates to ensure that there uh, is not evidence of extreme uh, hateful uh, views or associations. And that's why in the uh, last election cycle, uh, that process screened out approximately 40 people with extreme views, uh, not, not being acceptable, not reflective of the values of our party or we believe the, the uh, mainstream Albertans. So the United Conservative Party is a mainstream party. We are in touch with the mainstream values of Albertans. We do not and will not tolerate uh, extreme or hateful sentiments. And so there's a process in place. Uh, now, with respect to the individual you just mentioned, I'm briefed that there was a unanimous recommendation from the local uh, candidate selection committee uh, against his candidacy because of uh, social media postings. And I understand that recommendation was upheld unanimously by all 10 members of the party's candidate screening committee. The individual has a right to make an appeal uh, and that appeal will go forward, uh, but ultimately um, the party has in place a rigorous process to ensure that extreme and hateful views um, do, not, do not end up uh, being accepted by, pers by prospective candidates. Amber, do you have a follow-up? Yes, I do. A new Think HQ poll is showing some dismal results as we are now less than a month away from the leadership vote. How do you plan to make up so much ground with so little time left? 
Well, I'll tell you, I'm actually very encouraged as I get around the province to hear the optimism and uh, support for the direction of Alberta's government, uh, the balanced budget that we've just tabled, uh, standing up to Prime Minister Trudeau's unreasonable uh, travel requirements uh, with respect to COVID, the lifting of measures and our ability to get life back to normal in the province, uh, the record levels of diversification and economic growth, uh, the government's response rapidly to address the rising costs of living and energy inflation by uh, effectively scrapping the provincial gas tax, uh, and so much more. So uh, I'm very encouraged to hear positive feedback everywhere I go across the province. Thank you. Thank you, Premier. We're now gonna go to the phones. Operator, can you please put through our first caller? Chris Chacon, Global. Hello, can you hear me? Loud and clear. Hello. Yeah, uh, my question is for the Premier. Uh, why was the decision made uh, to close the gun addiction centre during a, uh, a drug crisis? Uh, we saw that it was just, you know, announced uh, the reopening yesterday. Uh, yeah, so, you know, it, it closed and just to have it, you know, uh, it recently announced just a year later that it's going to be opening again. So I just wonder if I can, you can get your take on that. Sure. Uh, I'm going to refer that to Minister Luan, who um, has more current information on that. Uh, thank you, Premier. And uh, yes, uh, I was the Associate Minister for uh, Mental Health Addiction. Uh, I was part of that transition. Now I am the Minister of Community Social Services, where that uh, the gun center is being transferred from. Uh, so I can update you with that. Uh, the situation is uh, gun center previously was a uh, partially, uh, not fully a shelter, not fully qualified as a treatment facility. Uh, it's, it's kind of a half-half with a very low usage uh, of, uh, of services there. But in the meantime, we're developing new uh, treatment recovery centers. And in Edmonton, that was one that uh, through careful examination, many uh, uh, searches and landed as a potential site for the new uh, recovery uh, uh, center there. Uh, so uh, with the closing of uh, gun center from the social services previous portfolio, the facility has been transferred over to mental health and addiction. Now I believe uh, today is announcing uh, the, the, the uh, building of this new uh, brand new recovery center is in reality. I wanted to congratulate my colleague, uh, Social Minister Alice, following through our government commitment in that. Uh, we step up to the plate to uh, create, uh, I believe it's uh, five treatment centers across the province. Now, eventually, Edmonton has our share here. And that is a credit uh, uh, um, state of arts uh, facility that is dedicated for treatment. And that is a significant step up from where this uh, facility used to be. So for our burdens, I think it's a good use of assets we have. Uh, for vulnerable our burdens, this opened more doors for them. So I want to thank uh, the work our government did for that. And Chris, do you have a follow-up? Yeah, uh, yeah, just one more question here. Uh, just for the, the Premier, you know, Bill 4 is still a contentious topic for municipalities. Why didn't you address it more uh, you told municipalities not to come with a shopping list. When when should they address those concerns? Yeah, my comment about the shopping list was about fiscal demands, and I said that uh, we always invite input from municipalities, and they have their needs. Their job is to represent uh, or to advocate for those needs to the provincial government. The point I was making is that uh, we shouldn't get ahead of ourselves and start spending surpluses that we do not yet have. And secondly, we need to continue to be fiscally responsible because if we go back to the old ways of uh, blowing out our budget uh, during a boom cycle, then we have then the uh, bills come due during a bus cycle. We know the up and down roller coaster in this province's economy and fiscal situation. What we need is, to, is a much more stable, long-term fiscal and economic strategy as a province. That's why we're putting the pedal to the metal on economic diversification so we're less vulnerable to... Uh, energy price shocks, but it's also why we need to continue to uh, carefully control our spending. And uh, because if we just build up spending to reflect today's $110 WTI oil pr price, then we end up back to huge structural deficits when those prices inevitably come back down. So my message to municipalities was um, we will address key uh, pressure points in terms of, of services to citizens, as we are doing in this budget, with record high health spending, with announcements like today's on EMS, on uh, support for vulnerable pregnant women. 
but we have to do it in, in an overall context of fiscal responsibility, and I think the vast majority of municipal uh, leaders understand that. On uh, Bill 4, I did address that as well in my speech uh, to the Alberta municipalities this morning and said that as we, uh, we hope emerge from COVID, we need to move forward with unity and certainty, not confusion and division. Uh, and I uh, believe the vast majority of Albertans want to see one common, easy to understand approach province-wide. They don't want to see COVID policy continue to be a political football. There's already been too much division over COVID in the past two years. It's time for us to move, uh, move on and move forward together. Thank you, Premier. Operator, can you please put through our next caller? Shailene Skolsky, CTV. Hello, thank you for taking my question. My question is for the Premier. I apologize, it's not in regards to today's announcement. Um, Premier, the gas tax rebate you announced Monday isn't coming into effect until April 1st. You explained the delay was due to fuel already being purchased at a specific price. Economists I spoke with said there is no mechanical reason for this delay, and some pundits say the timing is more political to line up with the carbon tax hike on April 1st and your leadership review. Why not provide Albertans relief today? Oh, we, we would if we could. Believe me, uh, when our cabinet uh, committee met to discuss this uh, on Monday morning, I convened an emergency meeting to address the recent spike in oil prices, uh, and Minister Taze uh, came forward with options, and we pressed as hard as we could to see if we could implement this immediately. I would like to have announced this effective uh, uh, this, this, this past Monday, uh, but we had very strong uh, indications from the experts at the Department of Finance and Treasury Board that it was simply unfeasible because the retailers have already paid that, so their their cash, their uh, they put the cash out for the inventory that is currently in the tanks at um, gas stations across the province. So the excise tax is embedded into that gas inventory, and we don't have the the payment systems automatically to reimburse them for that. So if we were to have announced uh, effective immediately uh, the lifting of the uh, 13 cent uh, excise tax on Monday, it would not have been reflected at the pumps. Uh, and so uh, the, believe me, I came back at, at the Department of Finance two or three times uh, on Monday to see if there's any possible way we could move this faster given the pinch that people are feeling, uh, filling up their tanks and just dealing with the inflation. Uh, but uh, we were told a hard no that there was no technical way of getting that done. So if you'd like a technical briefing on the reasons why, I'd like to ask our staff to perhaps connect you with um, a, a spokesman for Treasury Board and Finance who can walk you through the, the technical and logistical details about how the tax is paid by retailers and how we, need, uh, we needed a couple of weeks uh, to, to take the tax out of the system um, and, uh, and ensure reimbursement for any remaining inventory on which the tax has been paid. Uh, so that, that's, uh, uh, that's exactly the reason, and, uh, but we, we're, this is very important relief. I just got off a call with the other premiers, none of whom have stepped up with this kind of price relief for consumers. Uh, and uh, believe me, if you, want to, if you want to look at this through a political lens, as you are, we would much rather Albertans see the full 13 cent benefit uh, coming from Alberta's government, rather than having that obscured, by the Trudeau carbon tax increase on April the 1st, because our 13 cent benefit ultimately will look like a 10 cent benefit. That, that, uh, but we don't look it through a political lens. We just wanna give people relief as quick as we can, knowing that the Alberta Treasury does benefit with higher prices, and we wanna pass on some of that to consumers as quick as we can. Shailen, do you have a follow-up? I do, yes, and thank you for that. Uh, just following up on that same uh, vein, economists examining the policy say it is actually more likely to help higher income families uh, who are purchasing more fuel and say other policy, policy alternatives such as a direct cash transfer would actually be more helpful to low income families who need it most. So why not choose the option that would help more Alberta families in most need? Well, why not you go out and actually talk to regular people at the pumps as, a, as opposed to a couple of hand-picked economists who will, you know, I mean, I, I know you, you guys go for the expert opinion you want for your story, let's be honest. Uh, I, I'm looking for the ordinary opinions of regular Albertans who can barely afford to fill up their gas tanks right now. This is an immediate thing that we can do to provide meaningful relief um, on something that's co connected to higher provincial revenues with oil prices. And um, look, part of this is philosophical. The, I, I'm, I'll go out on a limb here and say that the economists that, that you were talking to as the arbiters of truth on this are probably really big carbon tax fans. I'm not. I'm a big carbon tax enemy, as are most Albertans. 
because we think carbon taxes just punish people for heating their homes, filling up their gas tanks, uh, and uh, getting to work. Um, we are opposed to punishing people for consuming energy. Those economists, the NDP and Liberals, are in favour of carbon taxes that, are, uh, that drive up energy prices. This is a fundamental philosophical difference. Albertan spoke to this in the last provincial election, and we are fulfilling our commitment, in a way, to scrap the carbon tax. We did that fully and legally um, as Bill Number 1 in the last legislature. Unfortunately, we lost the fight at the Supreme Court on the federal carbon tax. This is our back, I'll be totally honest with you, this is our backdoor way of scrapping a, a big portion of the carbon tax. And um, not to speak for my colleagues across the country, but I, sure, uh, I certainly heard a lot of my fellow premiers uh, on a call I just ended, uh, not happy that the federal government apparently intends to move forward with their April 1st carbon tax cut. In terms of cash benefits, we're doing that too. $150 rebate uh, for electricity consumers uh, that will be put on people's bills just as soon as we can get that through the 40 plus uh, electricity providers in the province. So there is cash relief coming as well. And I should say for low-income families, Alberta has the most, by far and away, the most transfer system, tax system for low-income families. In fact, 40% of Alberta uh, Albertans pay no provincial income tax because we have, by far and away, the most generous uh, basic exemption and system of transfers as well. That's something we should all uh, be proud of and take into account. Thank you, Premier. Operator, can you please put through our next caller? Don Braid, Calgary Herald. Uh, thank you for taking my call, and Premier, I too am uh, 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 sorry to uh, uh, not ask about this uh, very important announcement today. Sorry, not um, sorry. I just wanted to ask you about. Um, so I just wanted to ask you about uh, Wilkinson and his comments. Uh, all of a sudden, he kind of sounds like Jason Kenney, talking about how uh, you can replace oil and gas in, in Europe and not have any climate penalty to it and, and so forth. Um, and I'm just wondering how you react to that. I mean, th these are the folks who have made sure we can't export a single uh, whatever of, 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 of LNG and have nothing whatever in eastern Canada to ship LNG and just cancel the Saguenay project. Um, surely you must detect a large measure of hypocrisy in what both the, uh, the minister and the prime minister are saying about somehow helping um, helping Europe when, in fact, they've made it pretty well impossible for us to do that. Yeah, for sure. I actually shared a podium with Minister Wilkinson in Houston on Tuesday night, and he delivered a speech that sounded like it could have come from uh, Mr. Giebel lecturing energy producers about um, reducing production effectively and, and, uh, and, and focused entirely on the, on the climate imperative, which is important. But I'm glad if he's made comments since then on the energy supply and security urgency, I'm glad to hear that. I th I'm, I'm pretty sure Minister Wilkinson heard loud and clear from really smart players in the global energy industry, including champions of renewables and energy transition technologies who in Houston uh, were of one mind, just as Elon Musk uh, has said. I mean, listen, Let's get with the program here. I mean, when, when Elon Musk, the, the, the fellow who um, invented the Tesla, is, is saying, and, and I quote here, uh, we need to increase oil and gas output immediately. Extraordinary times demand extraordinary measures. Obviously, this would uh, negatively affect Tesla, but sustainable energy solutions simply cannot react instantaneously to make up for Russian oil and gas exports. So I think that is a growing consensus. Um, I'm glad to hear from your comments that maybe the government of Canada is beginning to get it. I just got off a call with premiers um, where this was a widespread view and the minister, the premier of Quebec was not there. Um, but I revealed in my speech uh, in Houston that Quebec was encouraging Alberta to backstop energy Saguenay. They, they were telling us they were, they were big supporters of LNG because it would reduce global emissions while also supporting jobs in Canada. I don't know why Quebec subsequently went offside, um, and I don't know why Justin Trudeau gave Quebec a de facto veto over interprovincial pipelines. 
that are the exclusive constitutional responsibility of the national government. All I know is this, as a result of energy illiteracy from Ottawa in recent years, we killed a bunch of pipelines, Northern Gateway, Energy East, surrendered on, on Keystone XL, accepted interminable delays on TMX, have seen major investors pull out of energy Saguenay, and all of these projects that, that have been killed, delayed, or stranded. And now the world is paying the price with dependence on Russian conflict and war oil. So look, I think we're living through a bit of a paradigm shift here when it comes to energy policy, and it's time for Canada to wake up and smell the coffee. So it's nice to hear Minister Wilkinson saying that. I, I do believe, by the way, I mean, Alex Porbey of Synovus and Mark Little of Suncor confirmed uh, in Houston on Tuesday what I've been saying. I think that they can, uh, that the industry in Canada can produce more. We exported last month 4.1 million barrels per day. By the way, that's a record. There's still flex in the Enbridge mainline. There's flex in other pipelines. Um, and there's the uh, option of, um, there's, there's the possibility of pipeline optimization and line reversals, uh, all to get, and plus uh, the Gibson Diluent Reduction Unit at Hardesty, you add all those things up, and I believe we can get two to 400,000 additional barrels a day out of Alberta. That could replace most of the Russian oil taken off the, out of the American market uh, by President Biden this week. So we can play an immediate role, but we need those good sentiments to be turned into policy on an urgent basis to get some East and West Coast LNG at the very, at the very uh, least. Thank you, Premier. Don, do you have a follow-up? Yes. Uh, what about natural gas, though, Premier? I mean, that's uh, uh, as big as oil economically in Europe, if not more so from what I understand about it. And we really don't have any capacity to ship LNG ourselves. And I understand that Europe doesn't have much capacity to receive it. Is there any any possibility of sending natural gas through the states? Because they have uh, they have uh, several big LNG plants in the state. So is that the only way we could help them with natural gas? Well, I, I did address that uh, in my last answer, talking about the urgency of getting LNG built. But you're right; th th those <laughs> those are multi-year projects. On that point. Vladimir Putin is a long-term thinker. His invasion of Ukraine started not two weeks ago, but eight years ago in Crimea, and he was planning for that years before. So we in, in the democratic West, we have to play a long game too, and that's why we need the infrastructure build. In terms of the immediate possibilities for uh, additional shipment of gas, um, Minister uh, Savage is in discussions with producers and midstream companies in Houston on this point today. Um, and uh, she reports to me that uh, uh, there's, there's interest and there may be some possibility, uh, but it's, it's quite limited in terms of getting more down to the U.S. Gulf Coast. The, the, the gas pipeline infrastructure between here and there uh, is, is complex, but, but there is a view that we could uh, perhaps contribute additional supply. Um, but uh, the best immediate shot is certainly LNG Canada, although that would not be uh, fully op. And I talked to Shell about it on the weekend or, or in Houston. That would not be fully operational until probably 2025. 20, uh, um, now that that would not immediately s supply European markets, but these molecules are are fungible. By which I mean, if we're selling more uh, gas to India. Uh, then uh, that frees up supply for, for Europe. So anywhere we can get it is a benefit to global peace and security. Thank you, Premier. Operator, can you please put through our next caller? Ashley Joanno, Post Media. Hi, both of these questions are for the Premier. I, I just want to piggyback a bit on what Don uh, was talking about. This afternoon, Federal Minister O'Regan is actually in Edmonton um, announcing the launch of the next round of uh, consultations for the Just Transition Plan. I'm, I'm wondering, I guess, what you think about this announcement at a time when you're pushing for more focus on upping production and infrastructure development. That it's completely tone deaf. Um, you know, folks, pick up a newspaper. Policies designed for a pre-invasion world show a lack of realism. Transition. I'll tell you, 
Vladimir Putin is not transitioning away from oil and gas development. Saudi Arabia and Venezuela and Iran are not transitioning away from oil and gas. In fact, President Biden is asking the, the latter three of those countries to produce and ship more. So the only transition they're interested in is transitioning democratic countries into a greater dependence on dictator oil. Uh, so uh, to, I like and respect Minister O'Regan, he, he I, 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 but I can't explain why they would be coming here to talk about putting people out of work in the energy basin, which is the answer to the global supply and security problems. This is exactly the wrong approach right now. Look, the message we are receiving from global investors and policymakers is Canada, reduce your emissions. Check. We're doing that. According to IHS, the, the world's leading energy think tank, we're on track to see absolute reductions in oil sands emissions uh, this decade and, and continued significant decline in, uh, in emissions intensity. So we're addressing the emissions issue in a big way. And hopefully the federal budget with a carbon capture investment tax credit will help to speed that up. But right now we're facing a global energy crisis and that's creating energy poverty. Um, this, is more, this is real and it's moral. It's not just about economics and Al this is not me defending the Alberta Treasury. In Europe, they've had to re cut, cut off half of their fertilizer production because of scarcity of gas. Do you know what that means? Lower egg yields, lower farm yields. That means higher food prices. That means people starving in the developing world. This is a global crisis. We need to act accordingly. Thank you, Premier. Ashley, do you have a follow-up? Yeah, I just want to pivot to your speech to municipal leaders uh, this morning. Um, one thing that you didn't acknowledge was uh, that the the rejection by municipal leaders of the proposal for a provincial potential provincial police force. Um, I'm wondering what your reaction is to the formal opposition. Yes, uh, of course. In, in 25 minutes, I couldn't address every issue, but. Uh, we we are always listen respectfully to what uh, municipal leaders have to say. We, in our round two consultations on the prospect of a provincial police force, uh, we are doing more detailed consultations, and I really hope that that folks actually read the report um, from KPMG and the Department of uh, Solicitor General because what it it paints a picture of a much more holistic approach to community policing, incorporating social services, psychologists, uh, abuse, uh, sorry, uh, substance abuse interventions, uh, alternative, uh, uh, an alternative approach to enforcement on, uh, on drugs to get people into treatment as opposed to into jail. It talks about, for the first time in Canadian history, guaranteed seats on a police commission for representatives of Indigenous people. Um, and the vision there is that a, a, a kid from Wetaskiwin can grow up, if she, if she wants to be a police officer, to serve her community, and go to depot, come back, and serve the community that she grew up in, that she knows. The, the, the people, the, the geography, the, uh, and, and all the local issues, as opposed to a revolving door of personnel from the RCMP. I think that would massively improve the quality of policing, community policing, I think that rural Albertans deserve the same kind of community policing that Edmontonians and Calgarians benefit from with their own local police services. So we'll continue with the consultations and uh, we'll take on board uh, any input from municipal leaders, but we think there's a lot of merit to this idea. Thank you, Premier. We have time for one more. Operator, can you please put through our final caller? Jessica Rob, CTV. Hi there, thanks for taking my question. Um, my question is actually for Minister uh, Luan, and unfortunately, I do, do apologize, it doesn't have anything to do with uh, today's announcement as well. Um, so workers in the community disability services sector say they are currently in crisis mode with people leaving a sector that was deemed to be essential during the pandemic because of unchanging low wages. People I spoke with say funding from the province hasn't changed since 2014 or with inflation meaning the average hour hourly wage sits at just under $19. I understand there is a one-year strategy to help address this called Blueprint CDS that came out last month, but immediate needs won't be addressed until the summer. For sector workers who say they are in crisis mode, why wait? 
Uh, thank you very much for that question. Um, I, I want to thank you for raising that uh, uh, question in public because uh, I am acutely aware uh, during the pandemic, uh, our partner agencies, uh, disability service agencies, has been uh, taking on the job of providing the, some of the most challenging work there during pandemic, and it's tough, and they, their pay level isn't, uh, comparing to many other sectors, is uh, on the high end of that. Uh, I want to thank them for stepping up to the plate, uh, carried, uh, caring for vulnerable burdens uh, uh, through today. Uh, my commitment to you is this. Uh, my ministry is working with uh, Alberta Council for uh, Disability Service Agency. We've given them a grant of 200,000 already uh, to study this issue and to come up with some uh, uh, strategic recommendations how we do that. Uh, on the same time, I want to assure you that uh, my ministry worked in partnership with uh, labor, immigration, and advanced education uh, through the Alberta at Work initiative that we newly announced. Uh, we are creating uh, pathways uh, through micro-credential and other uh, training possibilities so that we can address this uh, workforce uh, shortage in, in a long-term permanent way rather than uh, crisis after crisis kind of mode. So I look forward to working with our partners and uh, corresponding ministries to find some reasonable solutions uh, for this issue. Thank you, Minister. Jessica, do you have a follow-up? I do, thank you. Uh, so in a survey by the Alberta Disability Workers Association, almost 30% of the respondents said they have to work two or more jobs to make a living wage. In a campaign called Essential But Forgotten, community disability services workers are advocating for a 25% wage increase which would be just under $5 before taxes if you look at the average worker. Um, I guess, have you heard of the campaign? Uh, what would you say to these workers who are asking for the 25% wage increase? Um, once again, I want to convey my thankfulness to uh, our partner agencies for doing what they can, uh, recognizing there is a gap, re recognizing there's some uh, effort we need to work together to improve that. Uh, we are committed for that. Uh, on top of uh, what I mentioned earlier, I just want you to know during the pandemic, uh, we included uh, disability service workers for critical workers benefit program. Uh, through our partnership with federal government, we have allocated uh, over 100 million uh, support for them. So that is a part of uh, what we have done to today. Uh, our commitment of working with them to narrow the gap, uh, to provide the service is there, and I look forward. A budget 2022 reflected that. Yeah, um, I just wanted to add something to that. Thank you for the very good questions. Uh, uh, so we acknowledge that everybody's struggling with the cost of living and, and we just so much appreciate uh, people with disabilities who are in the workforce and, and employers who make special accommodations uh, to make the point of, of uh, recruiting, uh, hiring, training and supporting workers with disabilities. That's something I was very committed to as the federal employment minister and our government is committed to in fact, um, uh, Minister, I, I don't recall if you mentioned this, but when we created the Big Jobs Now program last year, it's the largest training program in Canadian or in Alberta history, the wage subsidy or the training subsidy for persons with disabilities is twice as much as for folks that don't have disabilities. So we, that and other wage subsidy and training incentives for people with disabilities, very much part of the programming that we deliver. But a 25% increase in the minimum wage would simply result in many people, minimum wage workers, being laid off by inflating wage costs beyond the ability of employers to pay. So sometimes we need to be careful of what we ask for. Uh, there is a very clear correlation between increases in minimum wages and employment levels. And so um, we want to continue to work in partnership with employers and, and the, the training agencies, social service organizations, to, to ensure that folks with disabilities have the skills they need to get into the workforce. We, we um, have special incentives for that, but I would not want to uh, price out of the labor market and into unemployment people who um, are, are, uh, are doing their best in the workforce right now. Thank you, Premier. Thanks everyone. That concludes our press conference today.